I'm excited to invite, uh, he's more than a friend, he's truly a, my brother from another mother. We, uh, uh, we got to know each other by butt dial, one of us butt dialed each other and uh, thought we were talking to someone else or thought, thought someone else th called, he thought I called him, I thought he called me, but it was definitely a divine appointment and uh, we become the best of friends and uh, I love this man. He, he's a man of God. And all he wants is to do God's will. And he leads his family well. I've gotten to just, uh, Julie and I love this family. They're extended family. So uh, I want you to give a warm, and we can say warm in June, a warm Minnesota welcome to Pastor Chad Hayes as he comes to deliver the word for us this morning. Pastor Chad. <laughs> Hey man, good morning. good morning. Hey, we love the Jews, X. My wife was uh, sitting on the front row, making fun of Pastor Kurt. <laughs> Said he should become a uh, what? What is it? A stewardess? If you're a male, a steward, a flight, a flight attendant. There you go. Said he should become a, a flight attendant. The exits are to the front, to the sides, to the rear. The way he talks with his hands. So she was she was sitting there mocking him. <laughs> Bathrooms are over here. It's, it could, I think you land planes too, right? Right, so, <laughs> man, it's good to be here. This is, uh, this is homecoming for us. I grew up in South Texas, but um, honestly, coming here feels more like coming home than coming to Texas. I get to go to Texas here in a, uh, a couple of weeks, but uh, it's like coming home here. This, we lived right here in the Parsonage, and uh, I also lived here in this building for two years serving on staff and uh, everything from janitor maintenance to uh, setting lawnmowers on fire in the parking lot. <laughs> A lot of amazing, amazing menace, uh, memories here. And uh, it truly is uh, a family to us. We love all of you and it's so good to see all of you and so good to see new faces. This church is growing. Um, I, I see just uh, numerical growth, maturity, and uh, it, it just does our hearts good to, to be here. We, we love this place very, very much. Honor Pastor Kurt, Julie, and their leadership to this house. Amen. You've got amazing pastors. Amen. amen. Amazing, amazing pastors. I honor the eldership team, uh, Pastor Gary, and all, all of this crew. You, you guys are led by some amazing leaders. You're, you're fortunate. We, we deal with probably 100 or more churches on a regular basis. This is probably one of the strongest leadership teams that I know in this house right here. Seriously. You guys are blessed and don't even know how blessed you are uh, to have this leadership. And then I want to honor Pastor Ken and Ruth Benson. Amen. Amazing, amazing leaders who led this house for over three decades and uh, served so well in this place. They're, they're a model and an, an example to all ministers uh, throughout the IMA. Amen. Amen. So, uh, so, so good to be here. I, I want to talk to you today about the unity of the faith. I'm going to join in with um, Pastor Kurt and this team that have been pat preaching through the, the book of Ephesians, and I want to talk to you about the unity of the faith. Um, th there is so much division and divisiveness in the body of Christ. We are, we are, uh, the Christian faith is known by its denominations. Think about that. The word denomination is a mathematical term for division. And the Christian circle, the Christian family is known for its denominations. Wait, like that, that's a mathematical term. What's, what's the least common denominator, right? What, how, how can we divide this? That's, that's the way the body of Christ is known in the earth. There are, did you know this? Over 45,000 denominations, Christian denominations on planet earth. Not all of it's bad. Um, tribes and fellowships and these types of things. I, I, I get to be a part of this IMA. It's, it's a family of churches and ministers, and we get together and encourage each other. So not, not all of it is, is bad, but the divisiveness of it is definitely not what Christ intended for the body. Definitely not. So we want to dive in and, and tackle that. Um, and and I, I'm coming from, we're in southern Indiana. We're, we're in the northern Louisville, Kentucky metro area across the Ohio River in Indiana. We call it the sunny side of Louisville. And... Um, yeah, so the right side of Louisville, you definitely don't want to live in Kentucky. Going across the bridge is like going on a mission. Uh, you got to, you got to. I think you need a passport to go to Kentucky from Indiana. 
you have to pay tolls. Every time we go over the river, we've got to pay tolls. So, uh, yeah, and so we're, man, we're right there. It, it, it's a beautiful place. We're right there by the Kentucky Derby. Uh, I, I was preaching at the, actually at the, the IMA conference in St. Louis back in September, and we had all these amazing speakers, and I got to speak the last night, and I told them, when, when you go to the Kentucky Derby, uh, like if you go there, we, I, I don't go there to gamble, but we have been to the museum. Just the, the historical, uh, you know, stuff that's there, it's just absolutely amazing. And so I, I, it's, when we have company come in, a lot of times we'll take them and we'll go and just kind of tour the grounds and see the history and all that kind of stuff. And they have, they always have in, in the, the paddocks, they always have one thoroughbred, one racehorse there for the guests as they come on that museum tour to see. And they put a donkey in the paddock next to it so the, the thoroughbred doesn't feel alone. And I always tell people that I feel like a, a donkey at the Kentucky Derby <laughs> when I have to stand up with all these great men and, of God and preach after them and all that kind of stuff. So, but anyway, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 is, is where we're going to be at today, and we're going to talk about the unity of the faith. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7 is where we're going to get our start. And I started to say, there, there where we live, it, it is like uh, kind of denomination mecca. Southern Seminary is just right across the river in Louisville. It's the, the largest seminary in the United States. It's a Baptist seminary. It's right there across the river. Uh, where we're at, we're, we're literally, where our church was at, uh, it was about, uh, I don't know, maybe two miles from uh, Branham Tabernacle, which is where William Branham preached, and Branhamism grew out of that. There's another denomination called Christ Gospel that grew out of that area that's planted hundreds and hundreds of churches all over the world. There's, there's all of these denominations, and there is so much division and contention amongst the believers, those who name the name of Christ, and they cannot get along. And it's sad, sad, sad to see it. So we're going we're gonna to talk about it. Ephesians chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 7. But to each of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. God has given these gifts to the church. Okay, And they're, they're, we, they're known as, uh, to us today as the fivefold ministry. Uh, this is the gift that God has given to the church for governance and for leadership in his kingdom. And I believe in all five of these gifts. I believe that they're all five functioning. I don't think there are the, like the apostles of Christ, but there are the, the apostles of the church still active, fivefold apostles, not the apostles of Christ, like the apostle Paul and Peter and those guys. But there are apostles, those who are sent for the work of establishing God's kingdom in territories. I believe that apostles are still active I would think of them a lot like missionaries or people who are, are sent into cities where there are no works, and they go in to raise up and to establish and to set the authority of God, which is, which is our mandate. Did you know that's our mandate, to set and establish the authority of God on planet Earth? Go and preach the gospel, teaching all na nations. That's, that's the mandate that the king has given us as his disciples, to go in and preach the, the, the gospel. And then we are all apostles because uh, in the sense that we are all sent. You're, you're sent to your community. You're sent to your neighborhood. You're sent to your workplace. You're sent to your school as an ambassador, as a, a messenger with the gospel of the kingdom. We're all apostles in that sense. But there are fivefold apostles. There are prophets, not in the sense of Isaiah or Jeremiah, but there are those that are gifted with prophetic giftings that still function in the church today. There are evangelists, those with a a special gift to reach souls and draw them and establish them into God's kingdom. There are pastors that shepherd. There are teachers. These are all, these five gifts are still relevant today in the body of Christ. And they have a purpose for, in, in verse 12, it says, it, it tells us and begins to expand upon their purpose for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. See, it's not Pastor Kurt's job to do all the ministry. Everybody who's sitting, if you're sitting on a chair in this place today, you have a responsibility to do the work of ministry. And it's the responsibility of the leadership of this house to equip you, to train you, to resource you, and to, um, 
to, to enable you to do the work and the ministry that God has called you to do. You have a specific assignment. You have a call upon your life that you're supposed to be doing to extend the kingdom of God throughout this, this community. And it's the job of the leadership of this house and those who come in like myself or any other guest minister that would come in. It's our job to equip you, to train you, to edify you, and, and to send you out to do the work of ministry. And then it's uh, these, these five-fold uh, ministers. They equip the saints for the work of ministry. Then they edify the body of Christ. It's, it's to build up the body of Christ. Now, verse 13 is really where I want to focus in. It says, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children. I just had an image of Jason Tuttle standing on this platform about three and a half, four years ago with a big baby bottle during one of my sermons. You remember that, <laughs> JT? <laughs> that would be, no longer be children. Tossed to and fro, the apostle JT. I heard that uh, Pastor Kurt dubbed him like an apostle. A couple of, I was listening to that sermon. <laughs> Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. We've got a lot of Christians just kind of blowing around. Do I believe this? Do I believe that? What's the latest trend? What's the latest fad? No, we're to be rooted and grounded in the word, not fickle but that we would be established with sound doctrine, not blown by every wind of new doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined, not divided, but joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. We're, we're hooked up together because you supply something that I need, and I can supply something that you need, and we all together supply, because as it, we began reading in that first verse, God has given us grace according to the measure of Christ's gift, right? And so we, we supply. We are all vital to the body of Christ. We are to supply something to this body that we are a part of according to the effective working by which every part does its share and causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Wow, what an amazing, amazing passage of Scripture. I love this book of Ephesians. Such rich truth about our Christian life, from our salvation to our call to our manner of deportment, the way that we live, the way that we live out our lives, the way that we deal with our children, the way that we lead in the church, the way that we uh, care for our wives, the way that we relate to one another. Uh, this is a, just a beautiful book of the Christian life. It is really, really an amazing book. Let's, let's thank God for his word. Father, we thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for your holy word. It is inspired. You breathed upon the men that wrote these verses. Lord, that they would give life to us. 2,000 years later, they are the source of all truth, and there is no other source but your holy word. It is an errant, infallible we can rely upon it. We can depend upon it. It is unchanging. It is the absolute truth in a society that, that, that denies and rejects truth. It is the source of truth. And I believe that as we look to your word, it unifies us. Our lives are established in truth and we come together stronger, healthier, and as, the, as our minds are shaped by your word, unity comes to your body. Father, we thank you for that, and we give you praise for it today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen. So this is a beautiful picture of how God has graced the church with apostolic leadership, fivefold ministers that equip us as the people of God to do the work of God, and they, they are put into the body to edify that bo the, the body of Christ and to uh, bring us to what verse 13 says is the unity of the faith. It's amazing how when Christians read the scripture and study the scripture, they end up divided. What really should happen when we read the scripture is it should unite us. The difference is pride and humility. 
The difference of what happens when you study scripture, if you're going to be united in the body of Christ or divide from your brothers, it's an issue of humility, right? What happens is we, we exalt our own ideas, man-made doctrines and traditions, our own wisdom, our own carnal knowledge and understanding of the scripture, we exalt that above the truth of the scripture, and that's where the division comes, right? And we live in a culture where there is just rampant division and divisiveness in the body of Christ. Contention. Contention. We are to contend for, and we're going to get to that in just a minute, we're to contend for the faith, not to be contentious about our faith. There, there's, there's a huge difference. And listen, by, by no means is this, this message that I'm going to preach today a call for you to be a pansy. <laughs> To be milk toast, to be a little jellyfish floating around in the water wherever the waves carry you, blown by dock, not, not at all, actually the opposite, the opposite. But it is a, this, this message is a call to humility, to acknowledge that you do not have the monopoly on truth. Jesus has the monopoly on truth, and it's found in his word, and we have to align ourselves with that. And as long as we refuse to do that and hold on to our little doctrines, our little pet doctrines that were made up in these denominations that we've come from, all of us have things. We, we, let, let's just all admit this right up front in this message. We all have areas in our life where we lack the truth. Can we all acknowledge that? If you can't, I'm preaching directly to you this morning. You're, you're the one that needs to hear this the most, right? Like my pastor used to say, if, if that rock hit you, it's, it's like he would say this. If, 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 uh, if you throw a rock into the uh, pack of dogs, the one that yelps is the one that gets hit, right? So if, if what I just, anything I've said so far has upset you, you're the one I'm preaching to this morning, all right? None of us have monopoly on the truth. None of us have full understanding of truth. We are working towards it. Amen? And we have to do that humbly. Humbly. I've, I've been a student of God's word for 27 years, and I still don't understand it all. Issues like Godhead and Trinity, we start thinking about the nature of God. And if, if you would uh, despise one of those camps and, and just prop yours as, as the right one, you're, you're in error. Now, listen, I believe that, that uh, modalism is heresy, and I believe that tritheism is heresy. But there, there's a triune nature of God. And if you think you have figured out how that works, this, I have deeply studied that nature, that the, 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 the one and three and the three. And one, I have studied that for 27 years and I still, it baffles me. I still don't fully get it. If you think that you can come in here and lecture us exactly to the T, how the gifts of the spirit are supposed to operate in the body of Christ, you've got to figure it out. You're arrogant. I've been studying it and practicing it for 27 years, and I still am struggling to figure all of it out. We need to acknowledge that we always have room for growth. We need to acknowledge that we don't know it all. We need to approach it with a humility. Amen? Some of, some of my uh, friends that I've been able to connect with since we've moved down to southern Indiana are, are from a, I grew up in a Pentecostal camp and I would, through our kids basketball league, I've been able to connect with a lot of the professors, the doctors who are teaching over at Southern Seminary. A lot of them are Calvinists. A lot of them are cessationists. A lot of them are in complete opposite uh, theological camps from where I'm at. But I'm going to tell you what, me and those brothers sit in the bleachers during the basketball games and we hash it out and it is beautiful. It is iron sharpening iron. And I've humbled myself to say, you know, I'm going to learn from these brothers. And they have taught me a whole lot about the nature of God and the word of God. Listen, we need to approach brothers who see things differently in the body of Christ. I'm not talking about foundational things like the fact that Jesus is the son of God and he came in the flesh. He was born into a virgin and he's the only way that we can be saved. The work that he did on Calvary is the only way that we can be saved. I'm not talking about compromising any of those things. But I'm saying when brothers have disagreements about how the gifts of the spirit operates or the governance of the church or the nature of God, and we're, we need to get together and we need to hash those things out in a, in a humble way, in a way that, that loves our brother, in a way that says, you know what, I'm going to learn because I don't have it all figured out. We are not supposed to be divided by studying the word of God. We are supposed to be united in studying the word of God, even when we disagree 
Pastor Kurt's one of my best friends. We probably have had times where we haven't seen every doctrine, every nuance of scripture eye to eye. But he and I have never, never been sideways with each other. We've never been upset with each other. We've never, we love each other. And we have brothers that, we, we meet with a group of seven pastors every month we almost we meet. And we've got guys in there that are close to cessationists and we've got guys in there with different viewpoints. And we love each other and we learn from each other. And it's powerful. It really is powerful. Let's talk about division. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7, uh, what, where, what did I just say? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1, verse 10. My glasses aren't working today. I think that's what it is. Getting old. Paul deals with this thing of division in the body of Christ. Now, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you would be perfectly, everybody say perfectly. Perfect. White people and black people, Baptists and Pentecostals, rich people and poor people, Educated and un uneducated. The cross brings us together perfectly. It should unite us perfectly. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are, here's the word, contentions among you. Again, Unity of faith never comes by contention. It comes for, by contending. Again, I'm not calling you to be a weak-kneed Christian. I'm not calling you to cower because somebody dif differs in their, their viewpoints. But I am calling you not to be contentious. Here, the, the picture of it is we, we need to be courageous, but not belligerent. There's nothing of belligerence in Christian courage. There's humility, love, and grace in our courage every single time towards the unbeliever, towards the guy from the other camp that we may not theologically agree with. There needs to be a grace upon our life, not a belligerence, not a contentiousness. We can contend with them for the faith. We can, that we, we can argue back and forth, but we need to, what, what Paul says, avoid the foolish and unlearned arguments, right? Verse 12, he says, I say this, that each of, each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. And he asks this question, he says, is Christ divided? What a powerful statement. I mean, he brings it home real quick. Christ is our king. And you're choosing to follow Benson or JT. Really? You're going to follow Kurt or Chad. Really? You're going to choose for, for those, to follow those fickle, carnal men with clay feet. You're going to put your stock in Billy Graham or John Piper, or Jimmy Swagger or John Hagee, or you name the name. Name your favorite old preacher. Or how about the young ones? Right, and you're gonna put your stock in Hillsong, you're gonna put your stock in Bethel, or you're gonna put your, your stock in Elevation and Stephen Furtick. You're gonna follow those guys when you can follow the king? Right, you're not here to follow Pastor Kurt. Great guy, I love that man, he's your, your, your shepherd and all that, but he ain't Jesus. I'm not Jesus. Anything that I say today that doesn't line up with what Jesus says, you can just throw it in the trash heap. But if I'm declaring the word of Christ, Jesus is king. It's his kingdom. Amen? It's not about the assemblies of God. It's not about the Baptist church. It's not about the Presbyterians. It's not about Pentecostal or Baptist or Methodist or any of these denominations. We're followers of Christ. Are you a Calvinist or Arminian? I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. So wherever he falls in there, that's where I fall. Right? I saw one guy on Facebook, I could not resist. I try to avoid Facebook arguments. <laughs> but this guy was just preaching the excellency of John Calvin. So I took this passage that we just read this morning in Ephesians chapter 4, 
about how we are to come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, the likeness and the stature of Jesus. And I, 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 I cut and paste that out of my Bible. I put it under my Facebook thing. And everywhere we talked about Jesus, I put John Calvin in. And I posted it on his wall. Man, he got mad. <laughs> Called me ignorant because I didn't believe the teachings of John Calvin. I believe John Calvin's teachings so far as it aligns with the teachings of Jesus. And where it departs, I will discard. We're not following Calvin. We're not following Arminius. We're not following the Baptists or the Pentecostals. or You know what? I, I am Pentecostal because I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I am Baptist because I believe in baptism. I'm Jehovah's Witness because I'm going to witness about Jehovah everywhere that I go. <laughs> By the way, you know why the Italians don't like Jehovah's Witness? They don't like any witnesses. <laughs> Hope, hopefully you're not Italian and offended by that this morning. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Was your favorite preacher crucified for you? Was Pastor Kurt crucified? Was Pastor Chad crucified for you? No. Christ is king. Were you baptized in the name of Kurt or Paul or Chad or Apollos or Gary or Michelle? No. I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius. At least any of you should say that I baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, at least the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Let me ask you this. How many of you think baptism is important? I do. How many of you think the doctrine of baptism is important? The Apostle Paul here takes baptism and says that unity is far more important than your divisions over the doctrines of baptism and who baptized you and what name you were baptized. The unity of the body suffers, Paul is saying, because of our divisions over these matters. And it's interesting that these people are all called to different people. They, I'm, a, I'm of a Paul. I, I'm a Paul. I'm of a, a Paulus. This guy baptized me. I was baptized at this church. I was baptized in this denomination. We will never come to the unity of faith as long as we choose to make idols of men. As long as we elevate the words of men, the doctrines of men above the doctrines of Christ, we will never have unity in the body of Christ. Again, I'm not against denominations. I think they have their place. I think God, I, I pray for a lot of those denominations. I really do. They have their place. But when we begin to exalt and elevate denomination over kingdom, the unity of the body of Christ suffers. We're called to the unity of the faith, not the divisiveness, not the contentiousness of this Christian culture that we live in in the West. We're called, man, it is amazing when you study the scriptures, how much of a call and command there is to work towards unity. Ephesians chapter 4, this chapter that we're in, the very first verses of it, listen to Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. It says, therefore, the, I, I, Paul, the, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring, everybody say endeavoring, endeavoring. to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body. There may be 45,000 denominations on planet Earth, but there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Well, you need to be rebaptized. 
Were you baptized in faith in Jesus? Well, was it Jesus' name or the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? What's the difference? There is one baptism. I'm going to to tell you that that, some of these arguments that we argue in the United States, the only place those happen are in the United States of America. My wife came from the UK. She was blown away by some of the things that we argue about in the church. (laughs) They just take what the Bible says and believe it. Well, but our denomination said, brother so-and-so said, there's one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. So the the call in verse 3 is to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Right? I I think Paul gives us some keys in those preceding verses. He says, I'm begging you. I I beseech you. I beg you to walk worthy of your call. If if you've got a contentious spirit, you are not walking worthy of the call of God that's on your life. If you're constantly fighting with coworkers and church members and uh, worldly people and you're contentious, you have a contentious spirit, you do not, you're not operating in the spirit of God when you do that. He says, I beg you to walk worthy of your calling with lowliness, with gentleness, with long suffering, patience. Are you patient with that man that doesn't believe eschatology? the way that you believe about eschatology. Well, he's post-trib or mid-trib or pre-trib or post-millennial or all-millennial. Uh, you think you've got it figured out. You don't. I watched four, four very, very learned, multiple doctorates, multiple, these men teach in seminaries, all this kind of stuff. They, they talked for two hours. I listened, I was driving from Wisconsin home and I, I, I listened to these guys discuss eschatology for four hours. They argued, none of them agreed on a single point. And the moderator at the end of that, he said, well, let's take the last 15 minutes of our time together and figure out what we actually agree on. You know what they finally came to that they agreed on? That Jesus is coming back. That was the one thing those, those four men who are very studied, very w- brilliant, godly men of God. And the one thing they could actually agree upon was Jesus is coming back. Stop reading the book of Revelation, looking for nuclear bombs, trying to figure out what nations. By the way, the United States really isn't a major role player in biblical prophecy. It's centered around Israel and those nations around it. Right? So they're telling you America's the eagle and Great Britain's the lion and Germany's the leopard and Russia's the bear. Where are you coming up with that? When you study Rome, uh, Revelation, the only things that you can certainly say that are accurately interpreted are the ones that the book itself actually interprets. It tells us what the angels are. It tells us what the candlesticks are. It tells us what, it, what we need to know about it. And the purpose is not so we can figure out who the Antichrist is and the day of Jesus' return so we can send till that day and get ready. That's not the point of the book. The point of Revelation is to exalt Christ and his kingdom. When you start reading it with that perspective, it will change your world. And it'll bring us to a unity of faith. And you could be pre-trib or mid-trib or post-trib and we can still be brothers in Christ. Listen, don't condemn somebody to hell just because they're not pre-trib or whatever you are. You're so certain you've got it figured out. I'm going to tell you, you're wrong. You need to be humbled this morning. You're wrong. I was wrong, am wrong, will be wrong about a lot of what I believe in the Bible. I'm going to tell you what, 27 years, my theology has changed over and over again. Not because so-and-so said it. Not because I watched it on YouTube. But when I read in the scripture and it contradicts my beliefs... I'm going to adjust my beliefs. That's the way we come to a place of unity of faith. And it takes these, these four things that Paul's talking about here. If we're going to grow in a unity, if we're going to keep the unity of the faith in the bond of peace, we're going to have to do these four things. We're going to have to learn to be lowly. That means tap your, wake your husband up and tell him you need to hear this. 
Lowliness is having a humble opinion of oneself. Well, I graduated Bible college four years. I've got a PhD. I've studied for 27 years. I know more than you. Big whoop to who? <laughs> Keep a humble opinion of oneself. A deep sense of one, one's moral littleness. Yeah, you figured it out. You pea-brained ninny. I'm, ta- I'm looking in the mirror talking to myself when I say that. Yeah, your theology is so right, you could set everybody else in the body of Christ right, straight. There's only one that can really do that, and his name is Jesus. It ain't you. It ain't me. We need a, a, a better sense of our moral littleness, right? You know, what, you know what we're doing? Solomon calls that the offering of fools. You know what the offering of fools is? It's running our mouths. Solomon says, when you come before the presence of God, shut your trap and let your words be few. Who in the world are you, you little pea-brained human being on planet Earth, when you come before the great God of heaven? I read commentaries, and there are some brilliant men of God. Those commentaries have helped me in ways to understand the Word of God. But one of my friends said it this way, the Word of God shines a lot of light on the commentaries. Right? See, the commentaries, sometimes they they contradict the doctrines of Christ. I'm going to stick with what Jesus said. See, every man, I don't care if it's Calvin or me or the greatest theologian, the doctor, the man with all the master's degrees, we are still moral pea brains in the sight of God. This lowliness is a modesty, it's a humility, it's a lowliness of mind. Then we get to gentleness. So these kind of like these two words kind of partner together. He said it twice. You need to be humble and gentle. You, you, you lower yourself. Get off of your high horse. Humble yourself. Be gentle. This word gentleness is meekness, mildness. It, it is a it's a Christian boldness without belligerence. It's standing in authority with authority. See, if I hold up a denominational handbook and declare it, I don't really have authority. But when I take, I don't have a Bible, shame on me. Got my iPad. When I take the Word of God, pretend it's a Bible, and hold it up, I'm stepping out with authority. The authority of, no pastor, no shepherd, no preacher, no evangelist, no teacher has any authority but the authority of God's Word. No denomination has any authority but the authority of God's Word. Then there's long-suffering. This is patience. So we, we need to work on this one. Long, I prayed for this a long time ago, and God gave me four kids. <laughs> patience, endurance, constancy, steadfastness, perseverance. Slowness in avenging wrongs. Aren't we quick when we think somebody's wrong when their theology did? Put them in their place. And it says we need to bear with one another in love. This is holding one another up in, in love. This is agape love. There, there are, in, in the Greek language, four words to talk about love. There's, there's eros, which, by the way, eros is never once used in Scripture. Eros is where we get our word erotic. It's a desire for things. It's a, it's a, it can be lustful. Desire, inordinate desire for things. That's, I, I, I love whatever. And, and it's an inordinate, erotic type of love. Then there's storge, storge, however you would say that. It's a familial love. By the way, eros love is all take. All take. I love that. Give it to me. Storge is a familial love. The way that I love my wife, the way that I love my kids, and those are give and take relationships. It's a give and take kind of love. Right? You love your friends, you mow their yard, and then they babysit your kids. It's give and take, give and take. Right? Then there's phileo, which is a brotherly love. Again, this is a give and take kind of love. The love that it's talking about here when it says that, that we are to forbear one another in love, this is all give. This is, a, this is a God kind of love. Nowhere in Scripture is this kind of love attributed to man apart from the grace of God. The only way that we as mortal human beings can operate in true agape love is through the grace of God coming to our lives and empowering us. It's the love of God coming to us and flowing through us. 
We need, we need to op- learn how to operate in agape love. All give. Man, if we can get to this kind of love, how many arguments would this diffuse? How many times would we, how many less times would we make fools of ourselves? Getting bent out of shape, losing our cool over doctrines. Listen, if you're losing your cool, arguing with people about doctrine, you're doing it wrong. If it makes you angry, you're doing it wrong. We're called to love. We're called to humility. Now we need to be bold, but it is never belligerent. It is never contentious, okay? In Jude, Jude 1 and 3, it says that we are, uh, he, he says, I exhort you to, that you would contend earnestly for the faith. We're, we're talking about unity of faith, right? He says, contend earnestly for it. And he's talking about this faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. The, the word of God, the canon of scripture, the truth about Jesus. We need to contend for that. We need, in, in this age, we need to courageously contend for the word of God. But it's with meekness, gentleness, long-suffering, and love that we contend. Who, who is Jude talking to? It tells us in Jude 1 and 1, he says, it's to, this, this letter is to those who are called, who are sanctified by God, and preserved in Jesus Christ. So he's talking to Christians and he's saying to you, those of us who are called and preserved in Jesus, those of us who have been sanctified, we are to contend for the faith. Then he gives an example of the heathen, of the divisive. Listen, Listen to these descriptions in verse 12. He says, these are spots in your love feasts. You know what this is? This is a love feast. We've come together this morning. This is a love feast. The the people, we love each other and we are feasting upon the word of God. This, this is a, every Sunday morning we have love feasts. And he says, these divisive people, these apostate people, they are spots in your love feast. The, the, the Greek word there for spots is literally a, a reef under the sea. And when the ship comes in, it hits that reef and it busts the ship up. So there, there are people in the body. Now, I'm not talking about people in the world. This is in the body. There are people that are so contentious and divisive and disruptive that there are like reefs that destroy ships in the body of Christ. They are spots in the love feast. Is that our nature? Are we divisive? Are we causing divisions? Are we causing those in the body to suffer because of our nature? It says, they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried by, about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, unfruitful people. Before you go lecturing everybody about all that you know and how they're wrong, examine the fruit of your life. How well are you doing discipling those who Christ has called you to lead? How healthy is your family? How healthy is the role that you're playing in the local church? How many people have you led to work of those heathens that you work with? Are you fruitless, contentious? And he says, they're twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. Anybody know some frothy Christians? Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Skipping down to verse 16, he says, these, these are grumblers. And, and again, thinking, think about divisiveness. They're grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust. They, may, they, they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. Another translation said they were following their own natural instincts. When when we're doing that, church, when we are following our own natural instincts, we will cause division in the body. 
when we're walking according to the Spirit, when we're humbly getting on our face before the Lord, getting direction for the Lord, allowing him to change us, shape our character, change our mindsets, change our attitudes, will be effective, fruitful, edifying the body, not ripping the body apart, but edifying one another in love. So that, that's a big picture of, of pro problematic people, the big problem in the church, divisiveness and these, these barrier reefs that break up shifts and these waves just flopping everywhere, foamy, floppy Christians. So what's the solution? Verse 20, he says, but you, beloved, building up yourself upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Build yourself up in the most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. We need to desire mercy. If, if we desire mercy, we will not be hard-hearted towards those who are unbelievers. We will not be unkind to those who err in the faith. Well, if, if we have sought mercy and received mercy, we will give mercy. Make a distinction. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 22. Some have compassion, on some, now this is talking about those unbelievers. This is talking about those divisive people that are in the church. Here's how we deal with it. Have, have compassion. Make a distinction. Save others with fear. Pulling them out of the fire. Ha hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Not their garments defiled by the flesh, but your own. The, the picture here is rotting, decaying flesh, taking those nasty garments off. Bloody, soiled, nasty garments, soiled by the flesh. Now, this is not us looking at them. This is a call for us to look at ourselves. Am I walking in the flesh? Am, is my flesh stinky, decaying, and is that the garment or am I putting on a robe of righteousness? Right? Not self-righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ. Now to him who is able to, to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. I, I want to wrap up with two needs that all of us in this room have. Number, the, number one is the need for submission. It is self-will and unsubmissiveness that causes divisions amongst us. Jude 1 and 8, we didn't read this one, but it says this, it says, likewise, it's talking about these same people. It says, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. I don't care if you like the president or the past president or not. Stop the railing. It is unchristian and ungodly, and it's unbecoming, and it is a reproach. Our message is, has nothing to do with the kingdoms of the world. So if you're on Facebook preaching politics and this politician or that politician and railing against them and destroying them, you are not doing the kingdom work. We have a greater message. It's called the gospel of the kingdom. It's this message that Jesus preached that he has called us to declare. Stop all that chatter. It's nothing but divisiveness. Trump is not a savior. You name a candidate. None of them are saviors. Christ is king. Christ is savior. Our only hope is King Jesus, period. And by the way, I want to say this while we're talking about the hope of our nation. It's not the White House. It's the church house. Listen, we, it has already begun. We are in the beginning of the third great awakening in the United States of America. Humble yourself, get on your face, seek God and pray, and he's going to move. That's the hope, right? That's Bible. That's Bible. That's my Bible. If my people who are called by my name will go to the polls and vote. Why do we think that's the remedy? It is not. We, we go and vote. I'm not, I'm not discouraging that. But it's not our hope. 
Seeking the face of God. We need to humble ourselves and submit. We need to submit to authority. We need to learn not to reject authority, to submit to it. God put authority in my life, not, not to limit me, but to empower me. And the more that I submit to it, the more life of God I experience. I seek men and women. I, I'm thankful for Pastor Kurt and others who cover me. I talk to this man on the phone weekly, monthly, because of things we're going through, th things I'm trying to understand, things God is trying to work in me as a leader, as a, as a father, as a, as a shepherd, as a, a leader in God's kingdom. I need covering. We all need covering. Likewise, you younger, and Peter, it says, submit yourselves to your elders. Let me read that again. Likewise, you younger, submit yourself to your elders. 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 If you don't understand submission, you don't understand the Bible. If you don't have covering, you don't understand the Bible. Because the word of God is replete with our call to submit to the, the, the leadership that God has put into our life. Yes, all of you. All, not some of you. Not the quiet ones. The most rowdy and mouthy of us need to learn to submit. All of you submit yourselves to one another. Submit yourselves to one another. I'm supposed to submit myself to, as much to JT, who's not a shepherd, as I am to Kurt Juzak, who is a shepherd. He's my brother in the Lord and been ordained an apostle, apparently. I'm to submit to Zach. I'm to submit to my wife. I'm to submit to Gary. We are to submit ourselves to one another, right? And this is not in a controlling sense, but hey, listen, I, I want my brother to speak truth when I need to hear it. When I'm in error, I want somebody that loves me enough to come alongside and straighten me out, get me back into the unity of the faith, the way of the kingdom. It's vital. We need submission. Submit yourselves one to another. Be clothed with humility. Everybody put your clothes on. Put on your humble jackets. For God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That, and that literally is a picture of fivefold covering. The hand of God, right? The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and in due season he will exalt you. I have never exalted myself in ministry. I don't call people and say, hey, have me come preach at your church. I've never politicked for a, petition, a position in, in, in any role. I've humbly submitted to the men and women of God that he's put in my life. Sometimes I haven't. But as a Christian man, I've learned to walk that out. And then God exalts. God exalts. We, we have a need, a great need for submission in the body of Christ today. We don't have unity in the body of Christ today because we are not submitted to each other. We'd rather do it our own way. And it's destroying us. Things I need to submit to. The Lordship, number one. Number one, first and foremost, the Lord, Lordship of Jesus Christ. Number two, the leadership of the Holy Ghost. Number three, the counsel of the Word of God. Number four, the apostolic leadership that surrounds me. And number five, the fraternity of saints. All of us need to submit to those five things. Every single one of us. Number two, our second great need, and I'm closing with this, is we, need a, we have a need for selflessness. There's a great need in the body of Christ today for selflessness. In verse 12 here in Jude, verse 12, talking about these characters, these divisive, foamy, frothy spots, that have come into our love feasts. In verse 12, he says, they're serving only themselves. They're serving only themselves. We have division in the body of Christ because we are self-willed, self-serving. In Philippians chapter two, Paul writes, and this, this book of Philippians, I would encourage you to go read it. It is, it is a call to unity. I spent 29 weeks preaching this at Return Church, preaching through the book of Philippians. And it's a great, the whole point of the book, there were two divisive women, and Paul is calling the church to work towards unity. And in that 
context, he says this, chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, unity of faith, having the same love, unity of faith, being of one accord, unity of faith, of one mind, unity of faith. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So we have a brother in our midst that's erring in, our, in, our, in his way. Do I care more about proving that my doctrine is right and offending him? Or am I going to prefer him gently, graciously, loving him and nudging him back into the way? I thank God that I've had many, many great men and women of God than when I was a fool. The first 18 months of my Christian walk, I bowed the alcoholism. I was, before that, I was three years every single day drunk. And for the first 18 months of my Christian walk, I would fall back into alcoholism. And I, I worked for a pastor. I worked out in his horse barn. And I would show up every, not every morning, but when I would fall off, I'd show up out at his barn clean and stall, still drunk because I'd gotten home at four o'clock in the morning. Sloshed. Overserved. And I would walk into that barn, alcohol still on my breath, hungover, <coughs> headache, erring from the way of Christ. But my uncle, who was my boss at the barn, was a, my pastor as well. And he graciously put his arm around me and urged me into the way. He contended for the faith in my life. In the ways that I was erring, he brought guidance, leadership, love, compassion, saved my soul, as the writer there in Jude said, from the grips of hell. We need to consider our ways. We need to contend Contend, not be contentious, but contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. That's courageously, but not belligerently, standing for truth. In, in a world that is confused with sexuality and the issue of life and morality and politics, their minds are muddled and they're in a haze and a fog and a confused and even, even many who walk through these doors on Sunday morning. It's not because we are belligerent that they're going to change. It's because that we exemplified. The only people that Jesus got ugly with were the religious zealots that were self-righteous and belligerent towards those who were erring in the way. But when he saw someone, woman taken in the act of adultery, what did he do? Wrote in the sand. And he showed us the perfect way to minister to someone who's erring. He says, woman, where are your accusers? Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. He did not condemn her. He did not condone the way of her error but he brought conviction and empowered her. Go and sin no more. Jesus modeled perfectly the way that we are to minister to those who err. Paul wrote in Galatians, when you see your brother overtaken with a fault, if your brother's in error, first consider yourself. Are you in those garments that are corrupted by the nastiness of your flesh? Consider yourself first. And then go to your brother. And the heart has to be a heart of restoration, Paul says. Not to put them in their place. 
Not to, I'm going to set them straight. No. We love them. We approach them in humility. And we edify. We build up. We help them, as many have helped us, to learn to walk in the faith. Let's, let's stand together. I didn't want to preach that long, but I did. I say that every Sunday. But at least I didn't have five closings. I also didn't have five points, so this was a, a pointless message. Not at all. Listen, what I want to do is just, uh, if it's okay, can we, can we take a minute and just invite? Listen, if you want to come and just humble yourself before the Lord, maybe, maybe you're battling something. Maybe there's some turmoil that you've been going through. Maybe you just need encouragement. Maybe you need salvation today. Maybe you need a healing. Whatever it is, I want to open the altar up. I'm going to ask my wife to, to play. Would you come down to this altar and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you and just do what he desires to do? I believe God wants to do something in somebody today.